Hello, my name is Professor Tim Lynch. I'm a consultant neurologist at Mount Hospital, and I'm Chief Academic Officer of Ireland East Hospital Group and Vice Principal of Health Affairs in UCD. You're very welcome to our COVID-19 vaccination webinar, which is designed to give information about the COVID-19 vaccination to students in UCD and others. Um, I, this has been set up by Health Affairs in UCD in collaboration with Dr. Jason Last, the Dean of Students at UCD. We very much welcome this support. We've got three excellent speakers today, followed by a round table discussion, and we have a number of questions put to us by the students that we'll address at the end. And the three speakers are Professor Karina Butler, Dr. Carl O'Brien, and Dr. Neela O'Connor to address the various aspects of COVID-19 vaccination. So with that as a background, I'll go straight to introducing Dr. O'Brien, um, who is a consultant in infectious disease at St. Vincent's University Hospital. Carl is the clinical lead for the COVID assessment hub, as well as sexual health and HIV prevention support clinic. He is an active researcher with Professor Paddy Mallon at the Center for Experimental Pathogen Host Research within UCD and St. Vincent's Hospital, and has a particular interest in rapid diagnostics for viral infections. He's currently working on a large multidisciplinary team on multi site studies looking at, at the use of rapid antigen detection testing with students and staff on the campus of UCD. He's a member of the National Immunization Advisory Committee, or better known as NIAC, in infectious disease, um, and in particular in relation to COVID-19. So Carl, we very much welcome your talk, and I'll hand it over to you. Great. Uh, thanks very much for having me here this evening. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to speak to, to the UCD students and staff about uh, what's been a very uh, dynamic and challenging year. Uh, in particular, thanks to UCD um, Health Affairs and to the, the Dean of Students uh, for allowing me this opportunity. So um, I'd like to give a quick kind of an overview of, of, of our experience here at Vincent's uh, in the past uh, 15 months of COVID-19 disease and how it's affected uh, staff and the patients and how we, what we've had to do to, to adjust uh, to, to, to manage these, these challenges. So in terms of the epidemiology, uh, COVID-19 really has had a very significant effect globally. There are over 158 million cases that have been diagnosed uh, to date with over 3 million deaths. Of course, uh, because of several geopolitical uh, challenges and challenges with healthcare infrastructures um, from a global health perspective, uh, these are very much underestimates and are reflective of uh, the, the, the different healthcare systems um, whether they be you know, strong or, or, or less robust um, internationally. Uh, and of course, these figures don't take into, into account the very significant morbidity that relates to, to COVID-19 as well. So the more prolonged uh, post-COVID syndrome that we're seeing very, very frequently here in St. Vincent's. So just to briefly cover two terms that I'm sure you've, you've heard in the media already. Um, so this is the, 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 the basic reproductive number or the or not. So the or not is the, the average number of people that one person with, with SARS-CoV-2 is, is likely to infect. You'll often hear this in the media, perhaps the or not is 1.5 or it's 0 0.9. And that means that we can say that, you know, perhaps the trend to a decreasing number of, of, of people. And of course, when looking at the or not, we have to consider how many people might be vaccinated in the population and how many people have previously been exposed because the or not is based on, on, on the assumption that, that everyone uh, who, who, who who is exposed is naive to, to that particular infection. Another term you might have heard of is the, the infection fatality ratio or the IF4 and this is the number of individuals who die as a result of the disease uh, amongst all infected individuals and this is something that's, that's frequently referenced um, in the media. So how do we, you know, what kind of clinical presentation is there for, for COVID-19 when we're seeing it? So uh, there are several terms that you might have heard of. So we have asymptomatic. So asymptomatic infection means that someone has absolutely no symptoms at all of COVID-19. So you do the test, which is a PCR-based test, you identify the virus and they have no symptoms. And certainly at the beginning of, of COVID-19, um, we uh, might have slightly overestimated the, 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 the asymptomatic or underestimated the asymptomatic burden because it takes a while for you to develop symptoms. And we can refer to these people as pre-symptomatic. So I might be COVID positive today um, and have no symptoms, but perhaps in two or three days time, I might develop symptoms. So in that case, you know, I'm really uh, pre-symptomatic today. Um, there's another term that kind of was starting, started to use in the, in the, the, the media called palsy symptomatic. It's less frequently used now. And this is uh, referencing people who have very, very mild uh, symptoms of COVID-19, nothing too severe. And then we have the standard symptomatic term, which is, which is much more uh, in use. 
when it comes to asymptomatic infection, about 30 to 40 percent of, of all people with COVID-19 are probably asymptomatic. Uh, and asymptomatic and mild disease make up about 80 percent of all cases. So if you look at this study here, so this is a study from a, from a cruise ship uh, where they identified that about 33 percent of all people on the cruise ship who developed COVID-19 uh, did not have any symptoms at any point during the stage of, of, of their infection. Um, and to be honest, there are several other studies that have lower figures around 10 or 15 percent, and some, some few studies have gone up as far as 80 percent. And it really is going to depend on the population that you're looking at and, and how long you're looking at them. So are you catching them in the, the pre-symptomatic phase, perhaps, or are you going to capture them throughout the, the whole duration of infection to make sure they're, they're, they're really, really asymptomatic? So we would say that asymptomatic infection is really about 30 to 40 percent of cases. When we look at those more severe disease, uh, we see that about 15% of patients end up hospitalized as a result of COVID-19. And in Ireland, that's around you know, 12% or so by, 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 by the HPSA data. And about 5% of all patients uh, are admitted to the intensive care with 0.01% of patients ultimately dying. Now, to be honest, that might seem like a very low number, um, but it has a very, very significant impact on certain populations. And that uh, mortality is much, much higher in certain at-risk groups. So when we're looking at COVID-19, there are a few different stages and, and broadly we describe it in, in three different stages. So we talk about stage one, which is early infection. So that's when you uh, first get infected with the virus, you've got virus replicating you know, in the back of your throat and you start to develop mild symptoms such as you know, cough, fever, um, you might have you know, uh, myalgias or sore muscles, headache, diarrhea, vomiting, you might lose your sense of taste. And, and by and large, these are people who don't get, you know, uh, really, really sick, requiring you know, hospital admission just yet in this, in this early stage. But what happens is the virus starts to trigger your immune system. So your immune system starts to become more inflamed. And this results in kind of the, the, the pulmonary phase where you get this respiratory involvement. So you start to develop shortness of breath, hypoxia, where your, uh, your oxygen concentration uh, um, is reduced. And these are the people that start to come to the hospital then saying, I'm short of breath, I can't breathe, I can't walk up the stairs anymore. And they've got the, this, this combination of virus that's replicating uh, with this inflammation syndrome. And then as that inflammation progresses, it becomes uh, stage three, which is this hyperinflammation stage where you've got lots and lots of elevated cytokines inside your body, things like CRP or C-reactive protein, um, LDH, which is lactate dehydrogenase, um, interleukins like interleukin-6, D-dimer, ferritin, which is a, a marker of iron in your body, but also a marker of inflammation. And these things all start to, to rise really exponentially. And these are the people that start to become very, very unwell with COVID-19, uh, develop ARDS, they go to the intensive care unit, they are in shock, they get cardiac failure, and they're very, very, very unwell. And there is a fourth stage after this that's not described in this slide, and that's really the, the post-COVID syndrome. So those patients who, you know, they've gotten over their hyperinflammation, they've lived through that, but they've still got ongoing, abnormal, lower grade inflammation in their bodies with ongoing uh, symptomatology. So they might have ongoing shortness of breath, uh, chest pain, um, and, and things related to their COVID disease. So basically you get you know, your, your viral infection, it signals to your, uh, the inflammation cascade, your, your dendritic cells, your macrophages, your monocytes, just to get this cytokine storm. You have lots and lots of cytokines and inflammatory mediators there. And then that this leads to this multi-inflammatory state where you get multi-organ failure, ARDS, um, hyperinflammation, and, and, and possibly death. So these are really the patients that we want to prevent from, from, from getting this outcome because it, they're critically unwell when they develop this hyperinflammation syndrome. And this is what, what these patients can look like. So you can see here in the, in the second stage here, this is a chest x-ray of a patient um, who has developed uh, you know, a respiratory a pneumonitis. So pneumonitis refers to inflammation of your lungs. So slightly different from pneumonia, it's, it's inflammation of the lungs secondary to, to virus. And you can see there's this bilateral infiltrate in both lungs. So you've got this uh, diffuse infiltrate here. And all of this inflammation is triggered by the virus. And this means the patient is going to be hypoxic. They're going to have a low PO2 or a low oxygen concentration. And these are the people that are going to require, you know, coming into hospital, getting oxygen, getting a non-invasive ventilation, which is when you place a mask on their face and provided, uh, provide oxygen with pressure support 
or perhaps even intubation. And as this syndrome progresses, so this pneumonitis deteriorates, it gets worse. You can see here on these on the CT thorax here, uh, there's lots of ground glass changes. In picture B, with, you know, with the, 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 you have these yellow arrows, all that white area around there is ground glass change. Uh, the patient can then develop ARDS. And here in, in picture F down here, you can see they're actually developing lots of pneumonia as well. So they've got a, a bacterial pneumonia on top of all their pneumonia and all that excess fluid that's there within their lungs at the time. So these are really, really critically unwell patients when they get to this stage, they're in intensive care, they're getting very, um, very close monitoring by our ICU nurses and, and our ICU physicians. But there is a, a contrasting syndrome uh, in children. Um, and this is something that certainly uh, has, has, has as been seen you know, at an international level. I was recently uh, in a BBC article on uh, why so many babies are dying of COVID-19 in Brazil. And really, when you start to get to this really, really massively uncontrolled transmission of COVID, and you have lots and lots of, of young babies who are infected with COVID-19, you start to see more rare um, uh, sequelae or complications from COVID-19. So there's a syndrome called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC. And this is a very, very rare syndrome usually. And basically you get, again, this hyper-inflammatory cytokine storm uh, where children can present with, you know, cardiac, respiratory uh, or CNS disease and are, are very, very unwell as some time after they've been diagnosed with COVID-19. And this has, you know, a, a, a mortality re related to it. And currently it's estimated that about 1,300 babies in Brazil have died as a result of MISC. So it's a real tragedy when you have such uncontrolled viral transmission um, in, in such a young population. So who develops these complications, this pneumonitis? You know, what puts you at risk? And we can see here, there's a, there's a graph of something called odds ratios. And this is basically where we look at who's most likely to get the complications of COVID-19. Um, and you can see here, age is definitely the strongest risk factor. So the older you are, if you're 95 plus, you're most likely to develop the, the, the complications of COVID and most likely to die from COVID. So age is our number one uh, priority in terms of vaccination strategy. And that's why every country really has incorporated age into, into their vaccine plans. So if you look at uh, here in Ireland, you can, or, sorry, apologies. If you look at age and mortality, uh, you can see here that on this, um, this histogram, you can see that those who are over 80 have over 30 times the mortality than those who are, who are less than 29. So really, really uh, significant findings here. If you look at Ireland, there's some really great data here looking at um, hospitalisation, ICU admission and death. And again, you can see that the older you are, the more likely you are to be admitted to hospital, to get oxygen, to go to the intensive care or to die than someone who's, who's much, much younger. So age really is a very, very important um, risk factor for COVID-19 complications. There are other risk factors for COVID-19 though I'm sure you know, many of you will have heard of these before. So in particular, people who've got a low uh, immune system, so they're immunosuppressed, people who have um, you know, uh, bone marrow transplants, people who are on chemotherapy, uh, people who've got chronic respiratory disease, uh, we saw quite a lot of patients with asthma, we saw some patients with cystic fibrosis, uh, people who have organ transplant, and in particular diabetes. And diabetes is a very, very common disease. And again, uh, this is why we've incorporated diabetes into the priority grouping, because we know that people with diabetes are more prone to the complications of COVID-19. And in Vincent's, about 15% of all of our patients with COVID-19 uh, had a diagnosis of, of diabetes uh, before admission. One other risk factor you might have heard of is, is elevated BMI or obesity. And this is just um, a study from um, Henderson et al. in circulation, looking at um, obesity and how that was related to mo uh, mortality in COVID-19. So if you look at this on the top here, you can see that those who've got class one obesity, class one obesity is those who've got a BMI of 30 to 35, class two is 35 to 40, and class three is a BMI of 40 or more. And you can see in these red dots here that your mortality starts to rise as your BMI, BMI starts to rise. And we know that people who have a higher BMI have higher background levels of inflammation, and that inflammation may contribute to the, the, the risk factor of, of obesity 
for, for COVID-19 progression. And it's certainly something that we're trying to understand much, much better. And here in Vincent's, we're doing some really interesting studies. Uh, Dr. Stefano Savinelli and Dr. Feeney are doing a study looking at uh, fat biopsying patients. So we take a small biopsy of patients uh, from their abdomen, trying to identify what kind of inflammation is going on in their fat that might be contributing to their disease. So some really, really interesting studies that are coming down, to the, down the line so we can better understand exactly what's going on here. But there are lots of complications of, of, of COVID-19. It's not just pneumonitis or respiratory failure. Uh, people get bacterial complications in their lungs. They can get fungal complications in their lungs. So certainly we've seen some um, cases of aspergillus. And aspergillus is a very common fungus that we can inhale in the air. It's found in the, the soil and in plants. And, and certainly people who have COVID-19 can sometimes uh, more rarely get infection with aspergillus uh, as a complication of their infection. There's also very significant neurological complications. We saw quite a lot of delirium. And I think delirium is something we probably don't talk enough about and how you know, debilitating it is for an older person to come in to have COVID-19 and then to really you know, become very, very confused, very disorientated, very distressed uh, by this state of delirium. And this is something we saw quite a lot in our patients with COVID-19. And it was something that was really persistent that you know, the COVID-19 would have resolved and they would have delirium for several weeks after their COVID-19 diagnosis. It was really, really, really tough. And typically with delirium, you know, we love to, you know, to support the patient you know, by bringing their family in, by reorientating them. But it was very challenging on COVID wards when people were infectious. We weren't allowed to have visitors in to the same degree. Um, and we, we really weren't, uh, it, it was very challenging to, to manage these, these patients with, with delirium. There's some other complications, there are cardiac complications, things like myocarditis, which is when you get inflammation of your heart muscle and it may not work as well as a pump. You, might, you may get heart failure in, in more rare cases. Uh, people get diarrhea or GI problems. And in particular, the hematological complications of COVID was something we were very aware of. So people who clot more often, and we saw quite a lot of peas or pulmonary emboli. So these were clots in large vessels in their lungs. Uh, we saw strokes on occasion. Uh, we saw peripheral vascular disease that was, that was more evident during this, this, this state of inflammation. And we know that inflammation increases your risk for, 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 for these complications like, like thrombosis or clotting. So some really, really challenging uh, complications from COVID-19 that are not just related to the lungs, definitely. But there are lots of complications that we see after COVID-19 has, has settled down or you're no longer infectious. And we refer to this frequently as post-COVID syndrome or perhaps long COVID. Another term is the post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2. And we actually, when you, when you look at the numbers, you can see that about you know, a third of patients may still have symptoms ongoing up to nine months after having had COVID infection. So really, really significant symptoms for, for the patients. And it's a very broad range of categories you know, of symptoms that people might have. Fatigue is very, very common. And this can be really debilitating for patients. And it's something we shouldn't you know, downplay. That you know, people who really were, were uh, very busy, they were working full-time jobs, looking after their children, and suddenly you know, they're, they're not able to get out of bed. They're just so drained. And we see this with other viruses as well. We see this with uh, influenza after intensive care admission. We see it with uh, EVV. Um, patients comp complain of very, very significant fatigue after COVID-19. They also complain of, of very significant shortness of breath or dyspnea. And again, this is something that one of the more common reasons why people are referred to our post-COVID clinic. They've got ongoing shortness of breath. And it's really interesting because these are people, you know, who we CT scan, we, you know, we check out their lungs and perhaps there's no ground glass changes, there's no inflammation in their lungs. We check for clots and there's no clots in their lungs. Um, we do their pulmonary function tests, which are, which are special breathing tests. And we see that, you know, there's really good, you know, uh, normal breathing capacity. Uh, but then we look at their bloods and we can see, well, sometimes actually these people have abnormal inflammation still. And we're trying to figure out what exactly is going on. Why are they still short of breath? And what can we do from a therapeutics perspective to help, I know, resolve these, these very, very difficult and debilitating symptoms? So these are just some of the symptoms we see. As you can see, they're, they're really, really common in both hospitalized patients, but also in non-hospitalized patients. So someone might have had COVID disease you know, at home. You know, they didn't need an admission. They didn't desaturate. Uh, they didn't have you know, bad pneumonitis, but they still have ongoing shortness of breath at home, uh, despite uh, not being as, as, as sick as others might have been. So what treatments do we have for, for, for COVID-19 currently? 
So there are three main kind of, uh, kind of branches of, of, of medicines we have. So first of all, we've got steroids. And steroids really are you know, a fantastic tool. They're a very old medicine that we have. And there's a great study uh, that was looking at the use of dexamethasone. And dexamethasone is a really potent steroid or a potent anti-inflammatory. And uh, studies have shown that using dexamethasone in people who require oxygen uh, causes a reduction in um, mortality, a 30% reduction in mortality. So very, very, very significant uh, that, that this study identified that dexamethasone was, our, was, was, the, was the best treatment option. So anyone who comes into hospital requiring oxygen, requiring non-invasive ventilation or goes to the intensive care for intubation, you know, dexamethasone is, is, is the drug that we give straight away. We've got the best evidence base for this. It's a very, very cheap, inexpensive drug, uh, but has been shown to be very, very efficacious in, in patients with COVID-19 um, complications. Another medicine that we have is something called tocilizumab, and tocilizumab is a monoclonal antibody, um, and it's a monoclonal antibody against something called interleukin-6, and interleukin-6 is a very, very important part of this hyperinflammatory um, cytokine storm. And this is some data that um, Professor Mallon and uh, Dr. McCarthy published um, early last year on our experience in using tocilizumab. So uh, you can see here that in people who we gave tocilizumab to, there was a very significant reduction in their inflammatory markers afterwards. And that's because it's a monoclonal antibody to interleukin-6. And we can see their CRP and their ferritin all reducing very, very significantly after we gave tocilizumab. And we had quite a positive experience in this very, very, very small uh, descriptive study of using tocilizumab. There has been some much better data out recently. So the recovery study is a, is a, is a, is a very large study uh, that looks at the use of tocilizumab in people who were requiring oxygen and had an elevated CRP. So there was lots of inflammation going on there. And they demonstrated that there was a reduction in people requiring uh, admission to the intensive care and also a reduction in mortality overall. Now, to be honest, there are several other studies that have actually contradicted these findings, say, you know, tocilizumab doesn't work, there's no change. Uh, tocilizumab is um, an IL-6 inhibitor, so you are more prone to other infections, but we very rigorously screen our patients for these kinds of infections, so things like tuberculosis and diverticulitis would, would in particular be risk factors if you're giving um, tocilizumab. So it's quite safe to use tocilizumab as long as you're, 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 you know exactly who you're prescribing it to. And we're still doing some studies here on tocilizumab here in Vincent's. So we've got a study at um, CoVIRL002, where we're looking into the, the, how tocilizumab might work best and what patients to use it in. So what about antivirals? So, uh, well, we know from the, the describing the first three, the three stages that the virus is replicating very early in stage one, and then it starts to kick off this inflammation cascade. So, you know, do you, would antivirals work? Do you need to give them very, very early to reduce the amount of virus there? Or perhaps, I know, would you, you know, does it have any effect later on in disease? And typically, because um, there's this drug called remdesivir, it's an intravenous drug. Typically, it's only people who very late in disease have gotten it. And this study showed, you know, uh, a very mild to modest effect. And it essentially said that, you know, if you got remdesivir, you were going to be in hospital for three or four days less than those who didn't get remdesivir. And really, there isn't great data to show that remdesivir actually has any effect on mortality. And we did use remdesivir, certainly in Vincent's, for, for some time. However, we um, stopped using it because the data simply wasn't robust enough. And there are, again, some side effects for any medicine. And one of the side effects that we saw with remdesivir was a mild hepatitis. And you'd see someone's ALT you know, going up to five or 600. We'd stop the remdesivir and it would settle. And really, so we're not using remdesivir anymore because there just isn't great evidence that it really works, especially when there is inflammation you know, cascade, uh, and there's not as much virus around as there would have been at the very, very beginning. But there are lots and lots of other medicines that I'm sure you've heard of, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, zinc, azithromycin, colchicine, are, are some of those. Um, and really, um, unfortunately, we haven't found, you know, a great evidence base for using these medicines. And we always have to consider when we're prescribing a medicine, that there are side effects to any medicine. And if the benefits don't uh, you know, outweigh the side effects, then, then we really shouldn't be using these medicines. And initially there was you know, a lot of people saying that you know, when uh, in India prior to Christmas when the cases were, were, were lowering, they were coming down, that it was all due to ivermectin. And of course we can see that that's very much not the case in the studies and very much not the case in real life when you look at India and the devastating um, you know, numbers they're seeing every single day from COVID-19 
and there's no evidence to support that ivermectin really at, at the moment. But there's some really, really great um, research tools that we do have that help support you know, the decisions that we're making for COVID-19. So this is a really great study by, uh, by Professor Malin um, here in Vincent. So essentially what we did is we did whole genome sequencing of every virus that was, that was being admitted. So we, we took a sample of the, the, the nasal pharynx, we PCR'd it, we showed how much virus was there, and then we looked at you know, what kind of virus was there. And you can see here in the very start in wave one, you can see that there were certain subtypes that we saw quite uh, you know, much more frequently for COVID-19, you know, predominantly down here on the, on, the, on the bottom left. And then in wave two, which was you know, kind of September, October, November, December, uh, you can see that we had very, very different viral subtypes coming. So the B117 here, you can see emerging at, at this point. Um, and really, you know, what this demonstrates is that, you know, the virus that we saw in phase in, in, in the first wave from our experience within, within our catchment area was very much suppressed by all the, the non-pharmacologic interventions. So, you know, masking and social distancing and really, really, you know, was very, very effective. And new types of virus emerged thereafter. And actually, if you look at how these viruses were identified, you know, on a more national basis, you can see that these were actually, you know, imported viral strains. So new virus types that were introduced to Ireland. And this very, of course, you know, makes the, 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 the rationale for mandatory hotel quarantine as an effective way to prevent variants of concern in the future. Some of these variants of concern you'll have heard of before, uh, just to briefly go over some of them, you might have heard the B117, which is the, uh, was detected first in the United Kingdom, sometimes referred to as the Kent uh, viral strain. And this is something that's really the, the dominant strain now uh, here in Ireland, over 90% of cases are B117. And we know that it's, you know, it's much more transmissible and that there may be higher viral loads and really has become you know, very dominant here in Ireland. There's some other strains that we're, that we're aware of, the P1 uh, variant in Brazil uh, and the B1351 in South Africa. And these are variants that we have actually identified in Ireland, but thankfully you know, there are significantly fewer cases of these um, in, 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 in recent weeks than there was before. Uh, so, so that's very, very reassuring. And um, I'm sure from a vaccine perspective, we're really, really interested in these variants and how they might affect our vaccine efficacy and how vaccines can work against them. But I suppose when we, we think about COVID-19, uh, whilst there's lots of really, really interesting science and new uh, research coming out about how we can treat COVID-19, we really have to bring it back to the patient. And I think you know, from, for all infectious diseases consultants, I think you know, there are a few times you know, where it's been as, as challenging for, for all of the healthcare staff um, you know, within the hospital uh, dealing with this. And certainly it's reminiscent you know, of, of you know, the, the, the early days of AIDS when you know, we, we really were you know, in, in very, very challenging and, and, and dire circumstances. And some of the things that really strike me about the last year was you know, how uh, challenging it was for the patients, um, how difficult it was to be you know, in, a, in a ward, isolated from your family. You know, we would you know, uh, set up Skype and FaceTime calls to their families. This is really tough though. Someone has a delirium and, and they're, they're, they're drowsy perhaps, they can't communicate with the family. Very, very distressing for, for families at home not to be able to communicate with their, with their families, sometimes for, 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 for several weeks at a time. Really, really difficult. Um, and this is something that, 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 that I found you know, particularly tough um, during, the, during the last year. Uh, in particular, you know, for family members where you know, a partner might be positive, and the other partner might be too scared or nervous to come in because they could see how sick their partner had become as a result of COVID-19. And in, in particular for, for older people that you might have someone at home and say, look, you know, I really don't want to get COVID-19. I'm just too scared to come in. And that's, you know, was something that we, we really tried to, to reassure partners that they would come in. Uh, we would gown them in PPE. We would help them. We would support them to ensure that they were able to, to, to visit their family member in a, a, a really, really safe environment. But we know that you know uncontrolled viral transmission has has devastating consequences. And I think we're really fortunate that you know uh, in Ireland that despite you know a really nasty third wave, um, that we have such great leadership nationally, and that the Irish uh, community has really taken on board all of the uh, non-pharmacological interventions, wearing masks, social distancing. And now coming forward into this new era, you know, vaccination, seeing how excited people are to, to really get vaccinated and really pushing to, to, to get vaccinated. And I consider myself so privileged to be one person you know, as a healthcare worker uh, you know, who, who's vaccinated this year. And it's, you know, I really hope that as we go forward, uh, that you know, these scenes that we've seen in the last you know, 15 months 
are going to become a distant memory and we'll be able to move on to this, this new stage of COVID-19 where people are, are safe and secure in the knowledge that they have an effective vaccine that's pr protecting them from, from very, very severe disease. So thanks very much for this, for this opportunity to talk a bit about COVID-19. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Carl. That was excellent. Really enjoyed it. It's given me a great pleasure to introduce Professor Karina Butler, who's the UCD Professor of Paediatrics, Consultant Paediatrician, and Infectious Disease Specialist at the Children's Health Ireland, Cromlin and Tempest Street. Um, she chairs the National Immunization Advisory Committee, or otherwise we know in the radio as NIAC, of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, and is chair of Penta Foundation in the UK, which is an independent charity that seeks to promote research into infectious disease in children. She's appointed to the National Public Health Emergency Team, which is better known as NEFID. So I think she's the only member of both NEFID and NIAC, so it could not be a better speaker tonight to give us a synopsis of both, hearing from the horse's mouth, and is a member of the COVID-19 Expert Advisory Group of the Health Information Quality Authority. Karina's research is focused on prevention and management of HIV infection in children and adolescents, and is chair of the National Immunization Advisory Committee and is committed to prevention of infectious disease using safe and effective vaccines. So very much welcome Karina's talk tonight. Karina, over to you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak to the students of UCD about COVID. And um, you've listened to Cahal. And really after listening to Cahal, it just reminds us all of what a horrible year we've been through and the challenges that have faced so many people and families and what is still going on today in so many parts of the world and what could so easily happen here unless we really do everything to control this um, virus. And of course, one of the ways that we're, I suppose we're all seeing as the way out of this pandemic is in fact the use of vaccines. So, oops, is it this moves. It's about 15 months ago. Uh, no, it's just about, sorry, it's about, um, it was just last December when the newspaper headlines um, in the UK first announced the beginning of the end of the battle of COVID. And that was related to the advent of the vaccines. And I guess for some, they felt this was it. It was going to be a stroke, straight road ahead without any problems. However, introducing new vaccines at any time is always a challenge as you go through the rollout, get familiar with them, the population gets familiar with them. But when you're trying to do it in a pandemic time uh, where the data about COVID, about how it transmits the virus, the way the virus changes is just emerging, becomes an even more difficult task. And we're faced with many, many challenges because we have new vaccines that for COVID have been developed at a pace faster than any other uh, to date. Uh, yet the testing process, the safety has all been really very rigor rigorously analyzed. We're trying to disseminate that information so that people can make good assessments about the vaccines and balance it against that we know that the vaccines, when they're rolled out in the beginning, they have been used in the clinical trials, but not in the millions and millions of people where they would be subsequently. And we're balancing it, learning about the risks that come with them as well and how to get that correct balance of benefit versus risk. And then the other issue that we have to really um, tackle and become familiar with is the whole in misinformation that is disseminated because sometimes Chinese rumors start and things are said that really have no foundation whatsoever and gain a foothold. And so I guess that's also part of the goals uh, for NIAC is to try and get good, reliable information about vaccines with all their pros and cons so people can make an informed decision of the benefits and the risks. What are the vaccines doing? Well, what they're doing is they're combating this virus. You've heard about the clinical spectrum of disease, the different symptoms that people can get from the very 
innocuous type infections where you hardly even know you have it or might not know at all, to the very extreme where people end up in intensive care and can die. We know that those risks increase very much so with age, but we also know that this virus can pick out the young in an unpredictable way and that even people as young as teenagers or in their 20s can end up in ICU, even not having any underlying risk factors. So the risks are there, of course, across the board. And we know that even for some who've had very mild infections, that they can be left with some long lingering symptoms and have difficulty getting back to robust health. So in the natural course of events, what happens when we come infected with the virus, our body mounts its defenses, and in this case develops antibodies to block, hopefully control the virus and block further infection. So with the vaccines, what we know is one of the main antigens that triggers that immune response that is effective in protecting against the virus is the spike antigen on the surface of the virus. And that's shown in greater detail here. This is the virus with the spike antigen that links onto the receptor, in this case, the ACE2 receptor of maybe a lung cell. But in fact, those receptors are on many different cells throughout our body, because as Cahill said, this doesn't just affect the respiratory tract or the lungs. It can actually affect many different organ systems in the body. So what the vaccines do is they bring along the S a replica, as it were, of this antigen that stimulates the production of the antibodies to block and be there ready to prevent any virus from infecting the cells. Now, we can mention that there are drugs in development to do this as well, but as yet, we really haven't found any single therapeutic agent that is very good at preventing infection or getting rid of infection. So for now, um, the uh, vaccines will seem to be the most effective way forward. But what is actually very hard to um, imagine, we couldn't have imagined it, say, two years ago, that with a totally new infection, that we would have so many uh, vaccines being developed that are so effective so quickly. So there are many different what they're called platforms on which viruses, uh, vaccines are developed. Some just take the original virus, kill it off, and give a killed form of the virus to stimulate the production of those antibodies. Some give a weakened form of the virus uh, to do that. Some mimic the virus in other ways, so-called pseudovirus. That's kind of like the papilloma virus or HPV vaccine to stimulate those antibodies. Some take just little fragments of proteins from the virus and do that. And the other very novel technique that just really came into widescreen use this year was to use gen genetic, um, if you like, the science of genetics to uh, get an RNA uh, that encodes basically the blueprint of the virus and to give that. So when that is given into the cells, it makes these proteins that can be expressed on the cell and so generate the production of antibodies. So this isn't giving you an infection. This is basically just giving you, as it were, the architect's plans to tell the cell how to make the necessary proteins to stimulate the production of antibodies. And what's so nice about this is this messenger RNA. It cannot integrate into our cells. It only lasts there a very short time and is then rapidly degraded so it is not going to cause any long lasting effects there at all, because that's some of the concerns that people have voiced about this. And the two vaccines that we already have uh, licensed here in EMA in Europe are the Pfizer vaccine, so-called Comirnaty, and I see a typo there, and then the Moderna vaccine. And in clinical trials, as we've seen, they've proven very effective in preventing infection and severe disease and death from um, this infection. On the other side over here, we have the so-called adenovirus vector vaccines. 
So here you take an adenovirus, that's a common enough type of virus that, for example, children get. But in this case, you interfere with it so it can't make more of itself. It's a sort of a Trojan horse. And into that, then instead of the RNA, you put in the DNA that encodes for making those proteins. So it's just a different way of carrying that architect's blueprint into the cell so the cell can then start manufacturing the proteins that will trigger the immune system to develop the protective antibodies. And here we have Vaxevria, or that's the AstraZeneca vaccine. And the second one of that that is also licensed here is the Janssen vaccine. And then there are others in development. You've all probably heard about the Sputnik vaccine that was developed in Russia and is currently undergoing review in the EMA and there's also another one called CanSino that has been developed in China. So here we have four authorized vaccines at the moment with a couple of more, the Sputnik and the CureVac, which is an RNA, and a Novavax, a protein vaccine, and another one up here, the Valneva. All have been successful in the early trials and even some in advanced trials and now getting ready to be added to the armamentarium to fight this infection. So what about the vaccines um, that have been used so far? Well, when you see graphs that look like this, where you have those who didn't get the intervention, be it a drug, and they continue to have the problem that was there, in this case, episodes of infection with the, with the uh, coronavirus, versus those who got the vaccine or who got a drug and they didn't get any of those episodes of infection. And you see that wide gap between them. You almost don't need statistics to say that this is a hugely effective intervention. Here we have the people at the beginning of the trial. They're both getting episodes of infection at the same rate. And then after a number of days, as soon as about nine to 10 days here after the Pfizer vaccine, we see this separation and those who got the vaccines very low rates of those getting any episodes of infection afterwards. So very, very effective against protecting against infection where those who didn't get it, the same situation, this is a randomized control trial, continuing to become infected in the way they would have if they weren't involved in the trial. So that was the Pfizer trial, Comirnaty. This is the Moderna vaccine trial here. This is the Janssen trial over here. And this is the AstraZeneca trial. And all of them are effective at preventing against disease, against symptomatic disease, and very, very effective against protecting against severe disease. Now, one thing I want to highlight is that you'll hear well, the RNA vaccines, they've got much higher efficacy. Efficacy is that level of prevention shown in a clinical trial, and that that is higher than the levels that we see with the viral vector vaccines or the adenoviral vector vaccines. But you can't actually compare from one study to another like this, because these studies took place at different times in different places. So when these trials were going on, it was all the original viral strain that was circulating and there weren't as high rates as there were at the times that these were going on. So that those are things that could confound this and make them look as if they were going to be a little less um, effective than these. But even in that setting, all of them, as you will see, were very effective against protecting against hospitalization and against death. So what we're really interested in is that difference between efficacy, which is what we report in a clinical trial where everything is very controlled versus real world effectiveness. What happens when the vaccine is rolled out into the general population? Because that takes in a lot more factors. It takes in the handling of the vaccine, their use and what actually happens on the ground. And the first indication that these vaccines were going to prove as good as their clinical trials, if not better, was from Israel because they were ahead of the game in terms of using the Pfizer vaccine and um, began to report very early on that even after a first dose, you were beginning to see um, good effects. 
So this is just one sample of a study that was done in Israel, where in a large health organization, they took the people that were given the vaccine, and then they matched them to people who didn't get the vaccine for whatever reason, but who were living in the same area, were the same age, had roughly the same um, risk factors. And also it was done at a time when this first variant of concern, the UK variant was circulating. So this was a good test of how the vaccine was going to perform. And here we can see days after the vaccine, even as early as 15 days afterwards, we begin to see for infections or for symptomatic disease or protection against hospitalization, severe illness and death, very good benefits. And as you go out further, those benefits increase. And if you get your second dose and wait about seven days after, because that's when we say is the time probably of optimum or maximum protection, you've got very, very high rates of protection. So what about this column here? Well, this, these studies weren't designed to see if these would actually protect against infection as distinct from disease or symptoms, but actually they looked at that and they made best estimates, but based on data. And these viruses, these vaccines appear to protect against infection as well as against disease. And that was very important because if they protect against infection, they are also likely to protect against transmission and thus would have an impact even beyond those who they themselves are vaccinated. And that has since held up in further studies in the UK where they've looked at people who are vaccinated either with the Pfizer vaccine or with the AstraZeneca vaccine to see did they transmit it to people who were living in the house with them? Because we know that people household contacts, people living in the house have higher rates of acquiring the infection from someone than, for example, someone you are working with. So whereas transmission in the household for these virus could be as high as 30%, particularly with the B117 strain, for a casual contact in terms of in the workplace setting or that, it would be more likely to be down around 10%. So um, in UK studies of uh, household contacts, they showed that in those rare instances where there were some breakthrough infections in a vaccinated person, they did not transmit or transmitted at much lower rates to household contacts. So that was very good news. And just coming back to that Israel study, importantly, this is just graphically showing it across whether they symptomatic disease or severe disease or death, but it was effective across all ages. Because in the beginning, we were worried, would older people, would those over 70 or over 80, would they respond? And it was effective across old ages. And it was effective even in those who had underlying conditions. And the effectiveness was only reduced somewhat in those who really had quite a lot of comorbidities or underlying conditions. And the same was seen in the UK. So you're always reassured if you get the same results from more than one study and particularly in different areas, because that really validates it. And here in healthcare workers down here, we see the effectiveness of uh, even one dose, 70% against symptomatic disease and two doses higher again. And in this, in the elderly, so more than 80 years of age, this was protection against hospitalization, showing even again after one dose and then higher again after the two doses. So um, that was great news for the mRNA vaccines, but what about the AstraZeneca vaccine? Now in the UK, you may know that they rolled it out as a single dose for a delayed interval of 12 weeks because they wanted to get more people vaccinated as fast as they could, knowing that the overall effect might be a bit lower, but wanting to spread the wealth as it were wider. And uh, this study was carried out in Scotland where they have very nice link ups between their various um, electronic systems in terms of hospitalizations, people who are vaccinated, and they could tell what happened. So in a population of similar to ours, 5.4 million, here's looking at the different age groups. In orange, the AstraZeneca, which was mainly in the elderly as it happened, the Pfizer mainly in the younger, but right across the ages. And with the two we see, and this is after single dose, 
benefits from 14 days against hospitalization and severe disease. And remember that is our key target in terms of the vaccination program. The first thing was to try and protect people who are really getting sick from it. Then secondarily, we can think about protecting about infection. So this was very good news. So what about the vaccines as we've got to know them? We knew in the early um, the clinical trials that you always get some side effects after vaccines. We expected you might have the sore arm, a little bit of tiredness, headache, sore um, muscles. You get a kind of a flu-like symptom sometimes for some people, for others, nothing. Uh, but that's not unexpected. It's really just a wake up call to your immune system um, to show that your body is reacting and getting a good response. Now, the only thing that was a bit unusual in the trial, the early trials, is they thought they saw more instance of what's called a Bell's palsy or facial weakness on one side of the face. Uh, a little, there were four cases in those who got the vaccine and none in those who got the placebo and the same on the Moderna. But the interesting thing was they were just at the level that you would have expected by chance. So the question was, was this just a chance finding or was it real? And how did they uh, find out? Well, as you go into post-marketing surveillance and the vaccine is rolled out into millions of people rather than the thousands that were involved in these studies, you continue to survey. And actually what they found out over time is that there was no higher rate of Bell's palsy. So this was a chance occurrence because if you are rolling out vaccines to everybody all at once across all ages, all the normal events in life will happen. There will be people who fall off a curb, off a ladder, under a bus, get a heart attack, not due to the vaccine, but just happening at the same time by chance. And the key is to separate out those events and those rare events that actually may be related to the vaccine. And you have to do it by comparing it against what the background rate is. So Bell's palsy, not a, a continuing concern. What else came out that we didn't find in the initial studies? Well, we always know that there's a slight risk of um, a severe allergic reaction with whether it's with food, with your shellfish, with your antibiotics, with penicillin, it has been quoted as been about one in 40,000. With vaccines, we know that risk is there, but it's usually more like one in a million or less. And in the initial rollout, it seemed that the cases were occurring more frequently. And in fact, that has turned out to be the case. There is a somewhat higher rate of anaphylaxis than would be expected with other vaccines that we've had. And for the uh, Pfizer vaccine, that's a little bit higher than the Moderna vaccine uh, with about um, 11 cases for every million or 2.5 per million. But all of this happens within the early time frame. All of them respond to the standard anaphylaxis treatments. And there have now, because everyone was aware of it, no deaths related, everyone recovers. And in fact, as the numbers have rolled out, these rates have tended to decline. We know there's a slightly higher risk for people who have had allergic reactions to other things, but it's unpredictable. Uh, allergic reactions to um, any of the components of the vaccine would be a precaution or a contraindication. Uh, but uh, for example, an allergic reaction to food is not a contraindication. So what about the adenovirus vector vaccines? Well, in terms of the initial events, they were all somewhat similar. Well, one thing I will point out is that for the RNA vaccines, the side effects in terms of the injection site and feeling a bit fluey were more common in the younger cohorts than in the older cohorts. The same with the adenoviral ve vector vaccines. But the symptoms of, for example, the fatigue, headache and myalgia, they were a bit more common after the second dose with the uh, RNA vaccines, where they are less common after the second dose and more common after the first dose with the adenovirus vaccine. So did anything else turn up in that post-marketing when it's rolled out to the millions in terms of the adenovirus vector vaccines? Well, I'm sure you will all have heard of uh, the condition of unusual blood clots with low platelet counts. Now that is unusual, is to find very low platelet counts 
in someone who is clotting, who is not someone, for example, who is overwhelming sepsis in an intensive care setting. Um, so this was a very unusual happening. Um, and it was because of the ongoing surveillance and the pharmacovigilance that these were picked up because there was first a case in Austria or maybe two cases, and that was it. And then there was a case in Denmark. And then there were a couple of cases in Norway. And it was only because of the monitoring and everybody talking to everybody that it was a common denominator was raised. Could this be due to the vaccine? Well, where we have got to in that time, and it's just really since March that this has occurred, it's recognized that this may be a very rare side effect of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And um, so here, if we look at data from Europe up to the 24th of April, when 18 million doses have happened, there were a number of clotting events, 142. They spanned the ages, but they were mainly in people under 60 years of age and mainly a little bit more in women than in men. In the beginning, it seemed as if there were a lot more in women, but at the beginning of the vaccine program, a lot of healthcare workers got vaccinated and there are more females among the healthcare workers. So those kind of things can skew the results. And there were two forms. There was uh, some clotting of the venous sinuses or those, the blood draining uh, vessels from the brain, but they could also occur elsewhere. And overall, it was a risk of maybe now coming down to one in 125 to one in 150,000, a little bit more after the first dose. And we've only recently got data in terms of the risks after second dose. So from the UK who have been gathering the data and they, if you remember, were one of the first to roll it out. Um, we see here that that male female change really isn't that much different between them, but most are still in those younger. And it does seem that the risks are a little bit higher for younger people than for older people. Um, and unfortunately, regrettably, there is a certain, some people have died related to this. Uh, and the risk after a first dose, roughly around one in a hundred thousand. But interestingly, now that we have data in over two million second doses, it is not more frequent in second dose. In fact, it's much, much um, more infrequent. So in the United States, they were beginning to use the other adenovirus vector vaccine, the Janssen vaccine. And what's nice about both of these vaccines is they are much easier to handle. And the Janssen is just a one-shot vaccine. But they did see somewhat similar, maybe at a lower rate, but it's still early days, where they found some of these cases occurring, and they had 15 cases in almost 8 million. So it's an extremely rare event. Um, if you think, for example, another vaccine like measles vaccine that we all use all the time and don't think about, yet it does carry a risk of about one in a million deaths when sometimes someone who might be very immunocompromised gets the vaccine, but it's usually given at a stage where we wouldn't know that they were immunocompromised. So just to give a perspective in terms of the risk, because very often we find it hard to balance that risk. And of course, in all of this, we have to try and balance that risk against the very, very real risk of COVID. And you heard from Cahill how COVID itself carries a very high risk of clotting and about 25% of people who end up in ICU with COVID end up with serious clots. So you're always trying to do a benefit uh, risk analysis. So again, from the US, these uh, cases so far seemed more common in women, but with the same caveats that I spoke about before. And um, the instance here seems less so far, maybe overall, about one in 450 to one 500,000. And if you look just at the women who were um, vaccinated, it might be somewhat less. And only with just three, unfortunately, regrettably, but three deaths in um, about one in two million people. Now, the number of cases who would die from COVID in that time would be much, much more. 
So when you're trying to make a risk assessment or whether it's worth using the vaccines, uh, what you have to do is to look at what the stage of disease is in each country, what the risk groups is, and what alternatives you have. Because for example, if these were the only vaccines you had, you would not have a second thought about using any of them. And in fact, for example, the FDA have just reviewed the benefits of this Janssen vaccine and concluded that the risks are so small related to the risk from people getting COVID and dying from COVID that that benefit far outweighed the risk for all age groups. The AMA considered overall exactly the same, that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risk for all age groups, but they did recommend that each country should look at it for themselves, taking into account where they were at the stage of the COVID epidemic, because obviously if your risk of getting COVID is very high, then that risk, the balance tips way to one extreme, whereas if there's very little COVID circulating, you might have a different um, outcome. And this is now um, where in the Cambridge Centre, they've tried to try and put this into some format that we can generally understand when we look at it. And what it is here is looking at the different age groups and looking at what might be the risk of these clotting events. And you can see that they seem to go up a little bit from the older age groups to the younger age groups. And this is the number in each 100,000 versus the risk of COVID for that same age group, the risk of hospitalization. So balancing those two things. And you can see for 100,000 people, now this is if you have a lot of COVID circulating, so high exposure risk, this is where you've got medium exposure risk, and then this is where you have low exposure risk, and they have estimated for when you have very low exposure risk. So this depends on where in this um, level of COVID you can um, assess we are. Where we are in Ireland at the moment is that we're somewhere around low, possibly at times just coming out of medium, but we're not down at this level yet at all. So you can see that, you know, certainly in these older age groups, there's no question. And you might just wonder getting, if we're down, if we stay at this low risk, if you have an alternate vaccine, then that might be preferable to use. But the key thing is that making people aware of this because part of the reason that the early events had such a severe outcome was because people didn't recognize it and didn't know the um, best management for it. Whereas now that it's recognizable and we know that management with IVIG and avoidance of heparin can really uh, alter that outcome. So it may become a very manageable condition. So the main uh, point here is for everyone to know that in the time frame following vaccination, and these events, if they happen, usually occur within the two weeks. If they have any of these symptoms of breathlessness, pain and new pain in chest or stomach, swelling or coldness of the leg, severe worsening headache, bleeding, or bruises, or, or purple spots on their skin that are, are little blood blisters, that they should seek advice. Now, everybody virtually following the vaccination might have a headache in the first couple of days. It's only if these things occur about four days or later after your vaccine. So where are we in terms of the current recommendations? And recommendations regarding these vaccines are changing all the time. And I will be first to say, yes, um, in the media, people have accused NIAC of flip-flopping on this, but that's not the case. What it has been, it's been about looking at the evidence as it comes out and tailoring our way through this pathway to get the best effect for everybody. So overall, the risk-benefit profile of the mRNA and the adenoviral vector vaccines is favorable across all the ages um, can, against COVID because all these vac uh, vaccines are really very effective. Vaccine safety is always a priority and the balance of benefits for the adenoviral vector vaccines is clearly very favorable for those age 50 and older, 
but depending on the levels of virus that are circulating, that balance is a little bit more fine tuned. And so as you go down in the levels of virus circulating, and particularly towards the younger age groups, if you have an alternate vaccine, then that can be preferable. So what we have recommended at the moment is that any authorized vaccine is recommended for those who are aged over 50, including those with high risk or very high risk medical conditions. But as alternative vaccines are available, the mRNA vaccines are recommended for those aged under 50 years, including those with medical conditions. But if you're not in a situation where for whatever reason you can get these or where there would be a delay in getting those, then you lose that slight advantage over them and you should take the vaccine that is the soonest available to you because COVID is the biggest threat, far, far bigger than this very, very rare risk associated with the vaccines. And what you don't want is people to be in this situation, heading over the cliff edge of COVID, having a life raft, be it AstraZeneca available and having people walking away from it in a misperception of the magnitude of the risk. And so until we continue to roll out, get the vaccine rolled out, we also must know that we have to continue with all the public health measures and continue to stay safe. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I'm going to ask just one question for the next speaker. And, uh, what is the time frame for side effects presenting once I have the vaccine? Will they show up within a day or two? Well, the early side effects, um, for example, the injection site reactions, um, that usually comes on quite quickly, even four to six hours after it. You might have a sore arm that lasts for about 12 or 24 hours. In terms of feeling a bit fluey in that, very often it's within the 24 hours and they usually abate within 24, you know, within the 36, 48 hours and they shouldn't really be persisting beyond about four days. So new headache coming after about four days, the side effects in relation to these very rare clotting events, they usually come on about um, eight days on average and within two weeks of the vaccine. Great. Thank you for that, for a really superb talk and great view overall. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Neil O'Connor, who most importantly has been working in Cork City for 30 years as a general practitioner in Elwood Medical Practice. Uh, she's the Irish College of General Practitioners Clinical Lead for COVID-19, is also GP Lead on the HSE Antimicrobial Resistance and Infection Prevention and Control Team, um, and she's also the National COVID-19 member of the National COVID-19 Task Force on Vaccination. Nuna, over to you. You know, what was, what was very interesting there is, is I suppose, listening to Cahill and Karina, of course, it's amazing how much knowledge um, we have accrued about this new disease over the last um, uh, 15 months. And one comment I would make about, you know, the side effects of the vaccine and when they come, because um, in general practice, we give vaccines all the time. You know, it's, it's one of the bread and butter things that we do. But when we're talking about the code vaccines, we tell, we tell people, say, you know, we normally I give you the flu vaccine. I say, look, you know, might get a bit of a reaction site at your arm, but don't worry about it. This time we're very careful to explain to people that they will more than likely get side effects because many people do. Um, I know I myself, I, I couldn't lift my, lift my arm above my head for about uh, 48 hours and definitely had probably every, every of, the, of the side effects there. But I looked on that as, gosh, this is great. My immune system is sound and it's really responding to this. So I think when it comes to, to side effects, it's about counselling people beforehand as to what to expect. And one of the things with regard to um, COVID has been is the sheer volume of information um, and where to go to for a trusted site. So now this was one of the questions um, uh, that you had. And uh, so I'm going to mention uh, two sites in particular with regard to uh, vaccination. And so the main go-to site for any clinical information is the immunization.ie, which is the website 
for the National Immunisation Office. So there, and I've just given you a screenshot of a couple of things um, that's there. So you have COVID vaccine bulletins and that's week 19 is the one that's on at the moment. And that sort of summarises all of the new stuff that's come out, but also all of the frequently asked questions that tend to be coming in what patients are asking about, what clinicians are asking about, what's going out there on the ground, what's causing, as Karina said, you know, these kind of, there's these Chinese whispers going on about something and, and they tend to address that. So that's something that you can log on and you, and you could look at every week. There's a huge amount of education and, I, and it's fantastic to hear that hopefully medical students may end up supporting uh, the vaccination program during the summer. So things like how exactly do you give the injection and uh, this checklist beforehand. So it's it's all very, very sort of, but this is the place to go for all of the information uh, that you would need <clears throat> about each of the vaccines, access to the patient information leaflets. Next slide, please. It also then links you on to other guidance. So, for instance, one of the groups that we're going to be targeting now are pregnant women because the vaccine has now been recommended for uh, anyone who is pregnant uh, between 14 and 36 weeks. So uh, the RCPI, um, uh, the IOG, they've produced fantastic uh, decision aids for pregnant women. I've just shown on, on the left hand side there. And these are all signposted straight off the immunization website. But another one um, is that signposted is the HSE clinical guidance and evidence repository. So here you'll find um, documented all of the supporting evidence that surrounds an awful lot of the recommendations that we've made, recommendations about uh, whether it's about uh, 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 treatment, uh, vaccinations, huge things. If any, anything that you're looking for, you're probably going to find it here, and particularly um, uh, evidence and research that's relevant uh, to what we're doing in Ireland. Next slide. So, um, I was asked to do a bit about uh, the vaccination rollout out, out in practice, and I'm really going to talk about sort of a very high level kind of at this. So if you're going to um, roll out uh, um, a vaccination uh, program, first of all, you actually have to have a vaccination plan. Um, and then you have an implementation plan. So there were two things that were devised and they were published on in the 15th of December 2020. And if you look at the elements um, that were in the implementation of this vaccination program. So first of all, we had to do is we had to get a, a regular supply chain of vaccine. Um, we then had to know how we were going to store it. Um, we actually then had to be able to distribute it out. When you think about it to every GP surgery in the country, uh, to hospitals, we had to deliver it to to people in nursing homes scattered right around the country of all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, and then we had to figure out, well, who was actually going to administer it? And would it be the same people in, in different places? How were we going to tackle immunizing the whole of the country? Where would we even begin to start? Um, and so NIAC were very good because, because through NIAC, what we had was we did an allocation strategy. So we, we started with the most vulnerable, um, um, those at risk, most at risk of, of severe disease, which would be our elderly citizens in, in uh, long-term care facilities um, and those who care for them. So for, for our healthcare workers in our acute hospitals and, and out in the community. Um, so in terms then of, of vaccinating, so we had to look at for the long-term care, how would we go there? So we used actually our existing schools vaccination teams. So the decision was that they would actually go, but there was a lot of debate. Would the GPs go and do it or would, or how, you know, how were we going to try to uh, get everybody done in, in as quick a time frame as, as possible. And there was lots of discussions and ups and downs about how we would do this. So it was kind of the, the long-term care facilities were going to be done by the school vaccination teams. And then the GPs, because we know all of our over 70s population, thankfully, they would all have um, would tend to be registered with the GP. The vast majority of them have a medical card. So, and we are 95% of GPs are fully computerized. So we could draw the list of these people. So then it became where well, the GPs are going to get going on the over 70s. And then in the existing hospital structure to get the healthcare workers, what happened was they actually had peer vaccinators in the hospital and there were peer vaccinators in the community say who would do the flu vaccine every year. So, OK, let's try to mobilize the peer vaccinators within our acute hospital and the community to try to get the healthcare workers going. So if you just click on the next one, please. So you can see, um, so we're going from the 15th of December and we're now going to where we are 
today, which is in May 2021. So we've gone from having nothing, of, you know, nothing um, uh, with regard to COVID, COVID vaccine, now having four vaccines um, um, uh, licensed, available and, and uh, being used in this country, four more in the pipeline that Karina has spoken about. We now have this ultra low storage freezer capacity, which we never had before. We'd get these, you know, remember the photos of the big freezers arriving. We've got a massively in, in, in increased distribution capacity because we have an existing cold chain, but we had to build on that. We'd literally get more vans on the road that could deliver. Um, uh, they were already delivering our childhood vaccines, but now they bring these this, this other the 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 other vaccine pack, and we're always eagerly awaited to see how many we're going to get, and you know how how many because some of, some of them it, once there's a 120 hour um, a countdown once it leaves the deep freeze. So the time that it arrives to us and it's stamped, well, this now has to be used by 5 p.m. on Saturday, the, 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 the 20th. And so the clock has started and you have to make sure and there's, there's all sorts of um, uh, things. It's got to be, you know, we're using Pfizer vaccines. So there, there's very strict things. Um, you use it within a certain time frame. Once you once you open it, you've got to um, reconstitute it within two hours. Then you've got to administer it within six hours. So you know, it was a log, a very steep learning curve. Um, and we started with the acute hospitals. Um, their first vaccinations actually started on the 29th of, of, of December and very quickly followed on. Within a week, we were vaccinating our long-term care facilities. And then a couple of weeks later, they mobilized the GP practice teams. And so we're just at the phase now in general practice of in the next two weeks, we, we will have completed the second doses of everyone over 70 in this country through um, predominantly through uh, general practice and our community teams in the nursing homes. They also then the CHO uh, level community vaccination clinics started to vaccinate the healthcare workers within the community. Um, and so many of those popped up and a number of them have shut down. And then the next phase that we're into, as you can see, is the mass vaccination clinics. Um, so um, the, we now have 36 of them open um, as of this week. And we've had to build this whole massive um, software system um, where we can store all this data, um, but also um, a, a front facing and public facing portal where the public can actually self register they log on themselves, as many of you will, will be doing in the future, they can they can um, a, a say yes I'm, I'm ready and willing this is where I am I'd like to take my vaccine They get an appointment via text message, they turn up and they get their vaccine, um, which really is an amazing achievement, and then, of course. You know, at the moment, we're in this really lucky position where the vast majority of people want the vaccine. You know, they're just queuing up to get the vaccine. In fact, when we're giving it in general practice, like there's really very little conversation. It's quick here. Come on, let me in, let me out. And do I really have to wait the five minutes, 15 minutes because they just want the vaccine? But obviously, as we move on, you know, we are going to reach a certain amount of vaccine hesitancy. And already we're finding that we have to have bespoke uh, solutions um, uh, pregnancy um, uh, vaccines are going to have to be administered not as they would normally be through general practice but we're going to have to do those through the maternity hospitals and the mass vaccination clinics because of the type of mRNA vaccine and the vagaries about how it needs to be um, administered and then we have vulnerable populations who are more hesitant about vaccines and who may be harder to reach so you may have noticed on the news the homeless there are special um, uh, clinics uh, set up uh, with one in Dublin and, and, and one in Cork. But then you have communities who traditionally don't take vaccines. So the Roma community in Ireland, very hard even to get them to take childhood vaccines. So it's going to be a big challenge. We're going to have to develop um, more bespoke um, methods and, and ways and probably multiple ways to try to reach out and into uh, some of these communities. And, and all one of the reasons why and um, we need to, to collect all this data and have the reliable collection of, of the vaccines is because everyone's going to want to travel again and to travel, they're going to have a vaccine certificate. Um, and that's being organized at, at EU level. What, what are the, the components that are required for that? And eventually it's actually going to be in, in a digital app that you that you will actually have with your vaccine passport on it. 
And the target that's been set, and it looks like we're set to meet it, is that 80% of adults will be offered vac vaccination um, by the end of June 2021. So it's, it's an, been an enormous undertaking. And you, the, the, the health system gets criticised a lot. But you know, when you take a step back, um, and yet there have been bumps along the way, but really, uh, we've come um, incredibly far in such a short uh, period of time with this vaccine rollout. Next slide. Um, so this is the other website is gov.ie where we have um, um, uh, we have a geohive and there's a portal where you can actually look at well how many vaccines have been given um, up to it's about maybe 48 hours behind um, so you can see that that we're up at oh, just over 1.8 million vaccines from Sunday the 9th, 9th um, of May and it also breaks down into the cohort so you can see you know the cohort one would be the amount of people in the nursing homes uh, the next group would be the healthcare workers and then the big bulk um, uh, one of the big bulks at the moment has been the over 70s and it moves on down through the cohorts but also towards the left of the screen there there's more about you know how to access getting your cohort with vaccines, um, um, lots of Q and A, and um, and there's public opinions. These are you know they run. It's an Amoric survey, so attitudes um, uh, to the public about vaccines. But there's also lots of interesting things there. It's about people's levels of worry, people's levels of anxiety. So they're very interesting um, uh, 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 data to have a look at there. Next slide. And if we look at where we are with regard to Europe and, and, and the rollout, so um, this is a vaccine tracker uh, via ECDC, which is the European Center for Disease Control, and again, another really great information source. And you can see how we're doing relative to other countries. So the graph on, on the, the left there shows where Ireland is um, in, in terms of first vaccines having been um, administered uh, 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 to people in that population. So it's 30.8% there on, on the, with the data that they're collecting. But in actual fact, as of today, the data is 34% of the, the population has actually been offered their first dose. And so far, and we've very little vaccine hesitancy in Ireland. And in the Amoric survey, 69% of respondents who have not yet received the vaccine answered um, uh, that they will definitely take it on the 26th of April. And 17% answered that they will probably um, take it. 6% six, 6 didn't know, 4% um, probably not, and 4% definitely not. But if you look at, at that compared to other countries, that really is a very small level of vaccine hesitancy, despite, I mean, it dipped a little when we had the initial concerns about the rare clotting event, but it bounced back up by the following, by the following week. Um, and last week was our highest amount of vaccines delivered in a week with just almost 230,000 vaccines delivered, which would be across all of those um, points of access that patients have to get their vaccine. Next slide, please. And this is my final slide, um, just to show that we can already see in Ireland um, the impact of, of the vaccination, and it's really um, extremely encouraging. So we've had 98% reduction in COVID cases among healthcare workers. So the top um, bar chart there that you can see would be the number of new laboratory confirmed cases of COVID-19 and hospital staff by week. So you can see there in January, falling off from 1,053 down to, you know, undetectable like you were talking about less than 10 uh, 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 cases um huge 90 99% reduction in the incidence of COVID in those um over 85 years of age and th this is the group that had the vast majority of people who who died uh, from COVID disease and there's been a huge um uh, reduction in outbreaks in nursing homes and and Again, another positive thing we begin to see is the vaccine dividend. So those who are now fully vaccinated, they're getting even extra freedoms than those who are not vaccinated. It's where we can now um, meet people um, uh, indoors without masks if you're fully vaccinated. And you can also invite another household uh, who are unvaccinated, provided they're not in a high risk uh, uh, group. So we're going to see more and more of this. So. Um, I suppose in summary, um, there has been a huge and steep learning curve for all of us, uh, but it is amazing to think that we've gone from a completely new disease that was unheard of 
to the situation we find ourselves in today, where we have a rapidly uh, rolling out a vaccination program for all of our population with four really, really good and effective vaccines. So thank you for the opportunity to try to give you a little bit of overview about the rollout. Peter, thank you for that. It's a, another great overview and really, I think, three fantastic talks. I just would make a comment. I think it's a real example, isn't it? Evidence-based medicine in real practice we're seeing live and a real example of what an academic health science system should really be, that we end up managing patients and treat them using evidence base as possibly we can. So the role of teaching, training, research, innovation is really even brought to the surface. And I think COVID-19 has taught us a lot that way. It's how we should actually plan many of our other care services across the, across the healthcare. We have a number of questions from students. I might just bounce these out. And um, this might be for both Karina and Nula. Should I, should I get the vaccine if I have a cold or a flu? Yeah, well, I suppose, I, I think with all, I might take that, Karina, I think with all vaccines, you, you need to be well, you, you shouldn't be physically unwell when you take a vaccine, because it may affect your um, immune system's ability to actually respond. Um, so you shouldn't take it if you're, if you're currently suffering uh, uh, from a cold or flu. I'll give this one to Might qualify it a little bit, uh, I yeah. suppose. If you're acute, I'm sure Nuno would agree with me if I say if you're acutely unwell, I yeah. mean, just because you have a sniffle doesn't mean you yeah. shouldn't go for the Should. vaccine. Yeah. But yeah. if you're acutely unwell, you know, febrile illness, yes, wait till you're better. Um, I would just add, if you're thinking of the flu, perhaps consider getting a COVID test as well. Yes, <laughs> yes, definitely. But, yeah, especially seeing as there's been no detected cases of flu in Ireland this year. Yeah. Which is interesting. We, I presume we're going to expect quite a surge later in the year when we all start meeting each other again, which could be interesting. It's going to give us a challenge, isn't it, perhaps? Does the current vaccine offer or reduce or remove transmission of the virus at all? Yes, uh, I think the data on it is, is just really coming out. I alluded to it a little bit in that household transmission study. Um, there have been some studies in Israel as well showing that in those who are vaccinated, that even if they have some virus present, that it's at much lower levels. And hopefully that would translate into less transmission. But the first hard evidence really has come from that household transmission study. And that certainly looks as if the vaccine is going to impact on transmission. There was a question also about the risk of the vaccine relation to side effects, in particular AstraZeneca and small blood clots, et cetera, compared to the risk of uh, infection with COVID-19. So I think Karina, you answered that pretty much. Be yeah, I, I think, you know, you're, you're always a little bit worried I, when we talk about risk and we talk about so much about the condition or the risk, just to make sure that everyone is well informed, you can sometimes lose sight of how exceedingly rare it is. Um, and so it's trying to balance that. These clots are not related to the ordinary type of clots that someone might get having flown on a plane or if they, for example, are associated with the oral contraceptive pill and having had one of those is not a contraindication to getting the AstraZeneca vaccine. These are very rare events. Good. Question for Cahal and my one. Do we have the sequencing capability or power genomics capability needed for a proper assessment of this vaccine? The UK leads in this predominantly because of uh, Prime Minister Cameron's investment in genomic sequencing, which we're behind. What do you think about that? Sure. So uh, I think it's really fantastic that um, there's such great investment in virology in the, in the last year and well, you know, long overdue investment in virology. Um, there's certainly, you know, there's been a lot of sequencing in the past in terms of influenza, but at a much smaller level. And I think, you know, it's reassuring looking at the, the, the cases reducing uh, nationally and we're sequencing a greater proportion of the national COVID strains now. So with those lower cases, you're able to sequence more. more. And understand exactly what's going on in, in, in the population. I see that actually most of it is the, the B117, the, the Kent variant or the UK variant that we're seeing by and large greater than 90% of, of, the, of the time. So that's very, very reassuring. Some really great work being done by the, by the National Virus Reference Lab and other associated labs. Okay. Next question Am I free to decline the vaccine due to personal choice? Vaccinations are not mandatory, absolutely uh, not. So yes, uh, people are free to decline the vaccine. We would strongly encourage people to get the vaccine because unfortunately COVID doesn't give one a choice and you often don't know that you're being offered COVID when you come face to face with it. And unfortunately it is unpredictable even for the young, whether they might be the one 
that would end up seriously ill or even die. And I think that's something, you know, uh, we all feel invincible, uh, even at my age. And when we're younger, we're even more invincible. But the reality is, yes, it can happen to you. Cahal may want to speak to that because he's had experience of it. Certainly. Seeing uh, it. Definitely, for sure. Um, I think whilst you know, we do see a lot of older people uh, you know, coming into the door with, with severe COVID, we have had some very young people. And you, I recall you, a, a guy in his 20s there only a few several weeks ago who you know, was critically unwell with, with COVID-19 and uh, how you know, worried his family were that you know, he wasn't going to, to do as well as, as, as we all hoped he would. Um, and, you know, for him afterwards, you know, reflecting on you know, whether you know, he got COVID before he had a chance to get a vaccine. And he very strongly told us you know, how he was really looking forward to getting his COVID vaccine uh, in the future um, to prevent these things from happening again. Um, so, so very much, you know, I would encourage young people to get the vaccine uh, because, you know, we, we see how, how, how important it is to prevent infection in, in, in those, that young cohort. I think that and I think if, if I could come in there as well, is that there, there is another benefit and because I do believe while we're waiting for more evidence to come out, but these vaccines are going to affect transmission. Absolutely. Uh, we've seen that it is going to happen. So in the young person getting it, because at the moment, the virus is predominantly circulating at the moment in the younger age groups. When they get the choice to get the vaccine, they are not only going to be benefiting themselves, but they will be benefiting those around them, both from not bringing home COVID, but also from decreasing the general levels of transmission in the community at large. And so helping the whole country open up and move on. So there are really a lot of benefits to be had from the vaccines. As you knew it was related, how do you handle that as a GP if you have a patient who's declining the vaccine for personal choice? Do you go through detail and try and persuade them or what do you do in that circumstance? Yeah, well, I think what you do is um, obviously you try to uh, give them as much information as possible, but you also try, you, I suppose, mainly what you do is you try to listen, you know, what, what are their fears, what are their concerns, because you find that the vast majority of them, they're, they're not um you know they they've heard things about the virus fertility is one thing um you know in 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 younger populations it, 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 all sorts of things have come up you know um and if you take the time uh, to listen to people's um uh, concerns to signpost them talk them through about the evidence that you know about signpost them to someplace reliable i mean the immunization website is great this super faq on that you know you know is it true that um, you know, some particular ingredient has been used in the in the vaccines. You know, and, and and allowing people time because there isn't. I mean, in the one sense, there isn't a rush. We're going to have plenty of vaccine, and we've lots of people to getting on it. So if people want to take some time and think about it for themselves, they have plenty of time. But they do. We do need to be very cognizant. I think we can get a little bit complacent uh, about the virus when we see the levels start to fall. Um, at the moment, uh, we're going at around four, you know, averaging, you know, around the 400 mark of cases um, every day. In the first two weeks of December, we were averaging 270 cases um, uh, per day. And within five weeks, we were up at six and a half thousand cases. OK, so the virus itself hasn't changed. In fact, we've more of the transmissible version. Um, and if this virus gets any chance at all, it is just going, it could take off again. Now, we won't get as many people dying or in hospital because we're protecting a lot of our more medically um, vulnerable people. But there will be people, young people, who will still end up in hospital. But the, the levels could actually significantly rise again. And I'm conscious of the students um, uh, who are probably doing their exams at the moment and they're going to be finishing up soon and there's going to be the, te well, not the temptation to party. Of course, they're going to want to enjoy some time uh, with, their, with their friends. So what we need to do is concentrate on what's the best way to get together with your friends safely. And that is get outdoors um, um, and, you know, that, that's the best place for you to get outdoors. You, you get together, have something to eat. You can have a drink outdoors, participate in some outdoor sports. And on that note, this week in particular, we've had several groups of outbreaks where people traveling in cars together to the beach, 
do not travel in cars together to the beach. Or if you do have to travel in a car, put masks on and open the windows. Um, because, you know, if these are, you know, where people are letting their guard down. And it's just such a shame uh, to see this circulating. And for people then maybe to be bringing it home to their own families um, uh, who haven't um, uh, been vaccinated. So that's, that's my, my, one of my key messages to the students listening at the moment. I think that's good advice. If maybe I paraphrase Margaret Thatcher on your bike might be the way to go to the beach. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, next question. Will I have to get a booster vaccine? Yes, uh, I think that's a good question because I think that probably is going to be a very likely scenario. Uh, I think the question will be when and what the nature of the booster vaccine will be working because we all know, we've all heard of the variants and different uh, variant strains that have been emerging. Uh, fortunately, as it happens, although uh, in the lab system, the vaccines might not produce as high a level of effective antibodies against the variants as against the original strain, they still produce more than enough to have effect, which is great. So there's a wide margin there. And we're still at a sense where these vaccines are effective against the variants. We know that for certain, for example, the variant that's our dominant strain here, all of the vaccines are effective against that. But it is likely that there will be a need for booster shots because we don't know the durability or how long the protection from these vaccines last. And in with that booster, it may well be that the vaccines will have been tweaked such that they will have a broad range of stronger protection against these kind of variants. And at the moment, there is work ongoing looking to develop the so-called pan-corona uh, virus vaccine that will target a more stable structure in the virus or put together a combination of targets within the virus such that there won't be the same likelihood to get so-called mutants. Good, thank you. How immune am I after the first of the two vaccines? I'm not sure if they're referring to the different vaccines available, but I suppose it's relevant to the, the, all the vaccines. I think you've covered that, Karina, pretty extensively. It's pretty clear from your data that all the vaccines are pretty effective. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Them. Well, now we are talking about, if you like, vaccine bonus. Yes. Um, and when can you consider yourself likely to be optimally protected? So um, with the Pfizer vaccine, after your two doses, it's a week after your two doses. With the Moderna, it's two weeks after your second dose. And with the AstraZeneca, uh, where that benefit is seen from three weeks after your first dose, there will be uh, ultimately some additional benefit in terms of the durability of the response from the second dose. So it's still key that you get your two doses. It's not a one dose vaccine. And the same with the, um, with the um, Janssen, it's, um, I could have a blank now, is it 14 days or? or 14 uh, days, yeah. 14 days after your Janssen vaccine. Yeah, yeah Actually, so there's a little difference between them. Yeah, the, I think I put a little table on it, with, with it on it on my last slide there, actually, as a little handy reminder. I think reminder. it was on the last slide there. Yes. Yeah. Great, so that's available actually in the talk, so we can refer back. Yeah. Thank you for that. Can I get the vaccine privately? Nope. No. <laughs> oh, fair enough, that's a straightforward answer. Thank you for that. Will I get a certificate when I'm fully vaccinated? Yes. Not, not, not straight not away. Not immediately. Not immediately. Uh, when, when you're fully vaccinated, you'll get you'll get a special card. Okay, so this is the this is the magic card. Okay, that you get, which 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 has, and this this is the only thing you have at the moment. Uh, so if if you do, if somebody does end up travelling overseas at the moment and they want to try to get out of mandatory hotel quarantine, this is this is what they have to. Um, uh, what they have to produce because it's the only record that you have that you actually have been vaccinated but eventually we, you you will have something actually on your mobile phone most likely you have a little digi passport thank you can i pass covid19 to another person after i'm vaccinated yes it is possible uh, because we know that vaccines aren't 100 percent protective for all people um so some people may get um, infection. There are infections reported after vaccination and some people may get infection and have absolutely no symptoms. The risk of them passing it to someone else is very much reduced, but the possibility is there. 
which is why we say that even when vaccinated, if you're with unvaccinated, you need to continue to wear your mask, do your social distancing, et cetera, because you want to reduce that small residual risk even further. Thank you. That's, and just to add there, that's very much the concept of herd immunity, that if, you know, whilst there's a small risk for one person, if everyone around you is also vaccinated, that all of your combined vaccination cover really contributes to, to everyone being in that really safe environment and looking after each other. And we also, just to add into that on that grounds, there are people for whom these vaccines will not work as well. And we're beginning to show, find, you know, to get the data. Uh, we, we suppose that it might happen, but it's now being confirmed that, for example, in those who are immunocompromised, they don't get as good a response to these vaccines as healthy people. That's not surprising. But therefore, there is also the onus on us to protect those who cannot respond to the vaccines as well as they might. And those who are at greatest risk of the complications of COVID. And they're also the group at greatest risk, yeah, exactly. You mentioned the myalgias, the fevers, and I got the old man flu after my vaccine, <laughs> um, so um, which Nula would have guessed. Um, but does that predict actually my response? For example, you're just saying that some people don't get a good response. Can you use that sort of myalgia and fevers and sore arm that Nula mentioned? Does that tell me that I'm going to have a good response or we've no data to tell us that yet? We've no data to really support that. One supposes that it may in some way correlate, but no, we've no data to support it. Mm -hmm. And paradoxically, it doesn't mean that if you don't have any of those symptoms, that you are less likely to respond to the vaccine. So it's not a good, uh, maybe it's a positive predictive, but it doesn't work the other way. Yep. Mm. Where is the best place to find information about the vaccine? And Nuda, you gave a couple of nice sites there. I think it might be the, yeah. we all echo that they're the ones to go to. Yeah. Yes. Fine. Yeah. So they're going to be on the talk. So those websites are available. Thank you for that. Is it true taking a painkiller before the vaccine helps with temporary side effects? I think taking a, a simple analgesic, be, be it paracetamol, before or after can certainly help, and it's not uh, seen to interfere with the responses. Uh, so, if but normally you'd wait until afterwards That's to see it, yeah. and take it when you need it, rather than trying to preempt it. Yeah, and it, most people, it's it's kind of almost the second day after the vaccine. We just you know make sure to tell them to have paracetamol to hand and. If they do um, a, a start to feel those the man flu symptoms, Tim, as you said, um, to um, take paracetamol for a couple of times that day. Um, but interestingly, we get very few phone calls um, actually in general practice, you know, about the vaccine of side effects. So, you know, we we, we counsel people about it, give them super information leaflets um, uh, uh, for the patients uh, for patients now, and they're all available um, through the immunisation uh, website and even just on HSC Live as well. It's a tremendous resource. And uh, and there's a post vaccination leaflet as well. So telling you specifically for each vaccine, this is to watch to watch out for it. This is the time frame. This is what you should do. This is when you should seek help and not to worry. And it you know it works. You know if if people are well informed, well counselled, um, and they 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 know what to expect, then you you'll get very uh, uh, little um, uh, need for that um, after uh, care and intervention. I mean, it's about any inf inf informed consent, really, isn't it? And there's a certain risk, but once people understand the risks and benefits and the sense of better, I think they will certainly go for it. So that's all the questions I have, unless the speakers have any other particular item they want to mention or, or ones that cropped up the discussion. But I think it's really a broad reaching discussion with the questions as well. We covered most of the bases. So I really want to thank all the speakers really for a fantastic contribution and especially their time this late evening here on Tuesday for all you um, contributing so well. Professor Greena Butler, Dr. Neil O'Connor, and Dr. Carl O'Brien. Uh, there were great talks, but also the discussion subsequently. And I thank UCD for support, Health Affairs in particular, but also Jason Last in the student's office. I think he's been fantastic support for developing this or doing this seminar, which I think has been a great idea. Evelyn Crowley, who's online, really did all the hard work behind this. Thank you, Evelyn. And Suzanne McMahon, also support in Health Affairs. I think the data is really important here. It's driving it. So I should also mention that we've been successful, as I haven't, but at UCD with Trinity, an application for COVID biobank. So we should be collecting samples here to drive more understanding of the biology of this virus and why it behaves differently in some people. And Carl's absolutely correct. I've been doing 
a number of consuls over the last year of patients in ICU. You see one young man, uh, one young woman in the 20s, 30s, 40s on a ventilator. This is a nasty virus and we need to understand why it behaves differently to different people. What's the immunology of the person? And that's where the biobank is going to come in. So that's a key development that we're going to hopefully be rolling out shortly between Trinity UCD and Paddy Mallon leading in that with Colin Bergen from St. James's. So on that note, really, I think um, all the evidence says vaccinations, nasty virus is a good idea, and people should be out there and stay well and get your vaccine. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much.